Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Scott Ryan and I am the principal for the early Beaverton Early Childhood Center that's piloting um, these uh, monthly series to support children and families and caregivers with their development. Um, today we're very fortunate to have uh, Lindsay Weinland, speech and language pathologist, as well as Shannon Hammerman, occupational therapist, who will be presenting on picky eater mealtime tips. So I'm going to go ahead and pass that information over, um, as well as um, if you need uh, Spanish interpretation, we'll also have information about how to support that as well. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Shannon, occupational therapist, like Scott said, and I'll be co-presenting today with Lindsay Wineland. I'm uh, Lindsay Wineland, speech-language pathologist. And then I just wanted to check can, uh, that our Spanish speaker, that our interpreters can hear us. Yes, we should have started before introductions with um, directing people to Spanish or English. Because okay. I think the Spanish speakers missed the the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, vamos a hacer la uh, sesión con interpretación simultánea eh, para los que hablan español. Entonces vamos a reiniciar, pero necesito que vayan. Can you show the slide? Oh, yeah, the slide is there. Um, es, en la pantalla están viendo um, que en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom está marcado con rojo. Un, um, un icono que parece como un, um, un planeta, ¿sí? Ahí, si pudieran hacer clic y um, es seleccionar el idioma, está en inglés y en español. Las personas que hablan inglés van a quedarse en inglés y los que hablan español les pedimos que se vayan a español. Yo me voy a mudar a ese canal junto con mi compañera Ana. Vamos a ser los intérpretes el día de hoy y, um, y vamos a... Um, vamos a trabajar desde ahí. Um, so I just um, explained everything to people and I'm gonna, I'm, 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 I directed them to the Spanish um, channel. I'm gonna move there and uh, Anna is gonna do the same. And uh, we can um, start with introductions again if it's not too much to ask. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So hopefully those of you um, that um, want to be in the Spanish speaking channel have found your way there. Um, and we'll just review who, who we are and um, what we're going to be going over today. So um, we are going to be reviewing just some tips about um, how to support maybe more picky eaters in your family. Um, my name is Shannon Hammerman. I'm an occupational therapist with um, our program at Beaverton Early Childhood Center, and I'll be co-presenting today with um, Lindsay, and I'll let her introduce herself. I'm Lindsay Wineland. I'm a speech and language pathologist with our three to five-year-old early childhood program. All right, and so um, we'll just start with kind of what our objectives are today and what to expect from this half hour that we all have um, together today. Um, the first thing we'll kind of go over is mealtime expectations for preschoolers. What is uh, t what is typical? What is kind of in the range of what to expect of a preschooler at mealtimes? Um, how to present new foods to preschoolers and toddlers? And then how to talk about um, foods. And Lindsay will get into a lot of ways to incorporate speech um, into your family mealtimes. All right, so I'll start by kind of going over what typical preschool and toddler mealtimes look like. Um, and you'll see a theme on this slide. There's lots of beige food. <laughs> Preschoolers tend to not be the most adventuresome eaters. Um, 
I chose specifically those dino nuggets on the top. Uh, they're, they're just one of those popular preschool foods. Um, so I just wanted to start from, um, having kind of fair expectations of our youngest family members that this is a time in development where the one thing a child can control throughout their day kind of consistently is what does and does not go in their mouth. Um, they don't get to decide where they go, lots of other things, but this can be a time where kiddos are really learning to exert their independence. And so mealtime can look fairly limited. Um, and a lot of children do become more picky um, around this, this age. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. So in this brief time today, what Lindsay really wanted to go over is ways to kind of maximize these family meal times and specifically how to present new foods because yes, preschoolers tend to be very picky, but um, they can learn to eat more foods. And it's kind of a, a time in development where um, you do want to make sure that you're still expanding their diet while meeting them where they're at. So one of my um, first kind of line of defense go-to strategies is called, um, I like to call it a learning plate. Um, sometimes you'll hear this strategy referred to as a no thank you plate. I really prefer the verbiage of learning plate because we're not saying no, we're just saying we're learning about that food. We're learning about if it can be near our plate, if we can smell it, if we can tolerate seeing it. Um, so what this can look a lot of different ways. Um, you can see on the pictures, I put an example of those like sectioned off plates are a great strategy for um, younger children to learn about new foods um, because it kind of separates them out. Um, but some children uh, oftentimes will need a new food maybe off their plate. So as you can see, there's a picture of the strawberries integrated in, and then there's a picture of the strawberries to the side. Um, so, and it's really important how we talk about this learning plate. I've had some kiddos that love cars that call it that we call it the foods parking spot i've even made like a little parking spot space that um we're not going to talk about taking a bite we're going to talk about like oh that's your food you're learning about today it can be a part of whatever you're having as a family meal the closer it looks or it shares um, characteristics with a food your child likes, the more success you'll probably have. Um, but this learning play it can be pretty powerful. And especially if I know it's so hard. I mean, I've got two kids at home too. Lindsay does as well. It's so tempting to say, you know, oh, just taste it. Just taste it. It's so yummy. Taste it. And I really encourage families, especially with picky eaters that are preschoolers that are wanting to exert their independence to give them that control of just be like, we're just learning about it um, and just work on that exposure and having the food nearby because then they have the opportunity to make the choice and to surprise you. And I'd like to take the opportunity to add into that about... Um how we can incorporate speech and language into this. And I'll be talking about this as Shannon presents along about how to incorporate speech and language um, and choices and power throughout the presentation. But as Shannon just said, giving the child a choice is very powerful too. And that gives you um, the ability to 
let them have control over like where that food is. Is the food on the plate with their other food or is it in a separate bowl off to the side? Um, and that gives them power. But also in that you can give them a verbal choice. You know, do you want the food on your plate or in a bowl? And if your kiddo is working on speech and language, that's an opportunity for them to have a model of you saying a location of where they want their food um, and describing where they want it. And then being able to tell you, and if it, if you're just modeling that and it's your child is at a point where it's just a point, I want my food on my plate or I want my food, they point over to the bowl. That is great too. That's them understanding that language and having power over their meal too, to tell you where they want that. No, absolutely. And then um, one of my favorite things too, as an occupational therapist, um, those of you that haven't interacted with occupational therapy yet, we we love the more sensory experiences that we can give kiddos, the better. And at this age, this is such um, great um, learning for for um, these kiddos. And so you can see the sweet picture I have of a little girl enjoying some spaghetti. Um, and I know every family has a different comfort level with the amount of messy play, but I just want to encourage you all that allowing for messy play, it's a great low pressure, fun, very developmentally appropriate way to learn about new foods. Manners will come later. Um, I know the cleanup isn't fun, especially those high chairs. You can find all kinds of things in the crevices. Um, <laughs> but um, I really messy play. There's much uh, with food. There's much more to it than um, just getting messy just because this is really how kiddos are learning to feel the textures of different foods in different ways, maybe on their face, on their hands. Um, they're smelling it on themselves. And if so that um, I really, really encourage families to um, let their child get messy with their food. And as well as getting messy, um, at the same time you're getting messy, that's such a great time to describe your food, whether mm -hmm. it's a new food or whether it's a food that they are already really comfortable with. Um, that's a great time to bring in vocabulary words where you can describe it crunchy, sweet, um, soft, salty, and just start introducing those words so that they can learn them as they eat foods that they are are already familiar with. And that way, when you are introducing new foods, you can describe them like this is the same as your sandwich, except it's sweet instead of salty. And just beginning to play with, just like you're playing with the food, beginning to play with your vocabulary words too, to help them have a, a vocabulary to describe and understand what their food might taste like. And that's a great lead in to our um, our next slide. Um, and so it's um, about the more about the kind of empowering language that can be really impactful during meal times. Um, so trying to just the the phrase that I try to just coach parents to be really intentional with is replacing, any kind of direct ask around foods with you can. That's an empowering statement. And that is not getting you into a power struggle. And it's putting the ownership back on the child. So um, it's the difference between, you know, take, take a bite. It's so yummy. And you can take a bite, you know, um, mm -hmm. and just that feels very different. And so I'll let Lindsay expand more on the language around that. Uh, well, like I was saying previously, just really playing with that, that language instead of yummy. And I know Shannon has said before about kind of getting away from yummy and yucky um, as, as descriptive words when we're talking about food and using more specific descriptive words when we're talking about the food that we're eating. And I would love to take a moment, and uh, I don't know if this will work or not, but to see if families would um, and participants today would love to put in the chat maybe 
um, some descriptive words that we might use to describe food. Um, it's a great place to talk about some of our opposite words, hot, cold, um, sweet, salty. Uh, what words can you think of as a family that you might add into describing some of the foods even your child is already eating? Let's see if anything starts to pop up in the chat. I'd be happy to if anybody wanted to unmute and share. Here we go, crunchy, chewy, mm -hmm. soft, those are great. Um, and just think about your own self if you were to go to a new restaurant, say you were gonna go to a Vietnamese restaurant and you had never been to a Vietnamese restaurant before and you were gonna order something and you asked a friend like, have you had this before and how they might describe it to you before because you would like a description too before you eat something or put it in your mouth knowing what it is and what it might be like before you order it and, and there's lots of different ways to describe these um different aspects of food as well like i had a student that um was referring to anything that wasn't that like bland kind of beige colored food as spicy. Mm. Um, and um, we worked on kind of reframing that to it's a big flavor. That's a big taste. Big isn't bad, but because she'd kind of gotten into this thing of like spicy is not good. And so different ways that we can reframe that language to support kiddos. Yeah, I love that. I love reframing it at reframing it as big rather than spicy or something that has become negative um, that we don't like. Um, uh, we have a comment in the chat um, uh -huh. from Victoria about liking the Eric Carl books that use shapes, colors, and counting to present the foods for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I love that too. Those books are a great way, another way to explore vocabulary and explore food, to go to the library and um, check out books about food. There's some great ones out there with um, some really beautiful descriptive words about food. Yeah, and they're actually, I love that too. And there's a lot of, if you search online, there's a lot of great ideas for fun little food play and food crafts based on that book which is another great way to get your kiddos engaged um, in just interacting with new foods, especially if it's not around mealtime where the focus is tasting and eating food, but it's just a family activity where the child is um, interacting with foods. Um, and another great place to do that is the grocery store. Uh, when you're going through the grocery store, uh, especially the produce section, because those fruits and vegetables I know are a high priority for families to, you know, get their children to explore and try. Um, that's a great time to go through and pick things up and feel them and smell them and um, look at the textures. And again, give your child those powerful choices of maybe looking at all the different produce and picking something to try on their own. Or do you want to try a red apple or do you want to try a green apple? And you've got the descriptive words, the green, the red um, in there that they're learning that vocabulary and they're getting the power at the same time to choose what they want to explore. Yeah. So another strategy um, in addition to that learning plate or the parking spot, whatever that kind of non-threatening way that your child's going to learn about new foods is. Um, I also like to think about um, kind of two concepts that go hand in hand being the just right challenge of what will the new food be. Um, and that's just assessing the properties of a new food you want to um, integrate into their diet? And is it at all similar to foods that they already like? Um, a long ago, when I used to do more of this feeding um, work, I 
it was not uncommon for me to have a child that I had a diet of all like potato chips. If a child is truly that limited and that sensory sensitive, um, having like, you know, a casserole or chili or like something like that with so much texture and flavor is probably not the just right challenge. But maybe for that child, a different brand of potato chips. Maybe we make homemade potato chips and we learn that potatoes are what make the potato chips. Potatoes are kind of similar when they're raw to looking like and feeling like apples. So the concept of that just right challenge and then food chaining from a highly preferred food to a new uh, a, a new um, kind of version of it. And so for our kiddos that are very, very, very sensory sensitive um, and have pretty solid routines that they need to stick to, um, it, it takes uh, it takes time and very gradual progressions, but it pays off. Um, if we move along too fast along these steps, that commonly backfires. Um, so these photos that I put on this slide all show all different ways that you can present a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So say that's your child's like food that they want to eat all day, every day. Does it seem to most of us, does it seem very different for a kiddo to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich whole and then one cut in half or open-faced or with toasted as an Uncrustable? We know that that doesn't change the flavor, the texture, but for our sensory sensitive kiddos, it it's, this is a big, this is a visual change for them. Um, when a sandwich is cut in half, you can see more of the peanut butter coming out. You can, for, so it's much more about just the taste and the texture of the food. Um, and these are also kiddos that you don't want to hide foods, um, like hide vegetables and things if they're that degree of sensitive because they will taste it. And then they're probably not going to trust what you give them next. <laughs> Um, so being very transparent in doing this work and learning about new foods and being like, look, this sandwich, we're going to cut it in half today. Do you want it to be cut this direction or this direction? Or I have all these different cookie cutters. What shape is your sandwich going to be today? Because not only will this help your child to just like, yes, this isn't introducing a new food, but it's working on their flexibility around food, which can work on their flexibility around other things. Um, it also, another thing that kiddos that are severely um, limited in the range of foods that they accept, they then will tend to get like hyper-focused on, I'm eating peanut butter jelly and sandwiches and that's all I'm eating. And then they stop. And then you've lost that food because they've worn out on it. And um, the burying it just with this small amount of variety can help kiddos keep their limited foods in their diet while also expanding. Um, and I loved all the language that Shannon just used there, like half and whole and um, diagonal and do you want it cut into squares? Do you want it in a circle? I love her picture here of a, the, the Hello Kitty cookie cutter. Um, that is a great way to also to get buy-in if your kid has your child has a preferred thing that they like. Uh, we just I just had a family that bought um, sea creature cookie cutters, and that's where they're going to begin with this exact thing is. Um, you know, letting him choose a sea creature cookie cutter to cut his sandwich into a shape, to have a new shape of sandwich. And I love the example in the chat. Did you see that one from Victoria? No. Yeah, that 
um, her son calls tomato soup sauce and likes dips and really likes to dip his sandwich in. But when they say, oh, it's soup, then kind of loses interest. So yeah, that's a great example of following the child's lead and linking it to something they do like. Like? Uh-huh. That actually, my own daughter, who's now 14, um, loves uh, loved ketchup as a preschooler. And that's actually how I got her to try tomato soup. So yeah, <laughs> links up very well. <laughs> that's great. Uh, and it just shows the powerful power of vocabulary of like what we're calling something does affect how the, your child feels about the food. And then this next slide just goes back into all the language development that Lindsay's been talking on uh, or talking about and how to continue to um, describe foods in a very keeping with those descriptors and trying to stay away from more of anything like take a bite it's yummy it's this and just keeping it more just neutral I love the idea of just having a time where we, you play with it and just describe it and there's no expectation for eating it. I know that's hard as parents to just think this is not going to be an eating time and we're just going to play with this food and smell it and um, describe it and um, do other things with it. But um, that would be a great time to just let them trust you that they're not going to have to eat this strange new thing and play with the vocabulary and all of the, the textures of the food. I love this picture that Shannon has of the separated different um, things to, to explore. Yeah. And it's fun. this could be something too, if you have a child that loves to sort things by colors, loves to line things up, but maybe in typically would have no interest in touching a strawberry this could be a great way to um, do it. And as, but most children, it takes at least 10 exposures to um, accept a new food. Kiddos with sensory differences that are restricted eaters, it takes so many. So don't, don't feel defeated ever if you introduce a new food and it goes poorly. It takes, it's a slow, slow process and it takes a lot of exposures. And as long as you're keeping it positive, um, then that's a success. All right. I think with, with one minute to spare, we, <laughs> we got to the end here. Um, and Definitely, if you have any questions about today's content, um, uh, follow up with your child's service coordinator. Uh, we know a lot of children um, in our services have feeding needs. And why, while it's not an education-related goal, we know that it's something that families often really would like some tips for. So that was kind of why we created this presentation um, to just give you a couple things to try um, uh, during your family meal times. All right. Great. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being here. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send us an email. Go ahead and get those questions answered for you. This will also be available um, on our YouTube channel, and we'll be sending out that link uh, shortly thereafter, probably uh, the week of November 27th. And if you have any ideas for topics in the future, please feel free to share those with us as well. Thanks so much. Have a great evening and a, a nice Thanksgiving holiday.